Well, good afternoon. I'm Daniel Benjamin. I'm the director of the Dickey Center, and I'm delighted to welcome you today to this conversation with Michael Morell, former deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency. And at the very outset, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, my gratitude to uh, Chris Bartell, class of 94, who couldn't be here today, for the very generous gift um, that he made, which has made uh, this week-long visit from Michael Morell possible. Now, on any given day of the week, if you could uh, put on your Harry Potter uh, invisibility cloak and slip into the White House, and actually, judging by recent events, you don't even have to put a cloak on, um, <laughs> and you slipped into the White House and you were to wander down into the basement of the West Wing, uh, you would see a, a rather bizarre uh, ritual going on in which uh, for two, but more likely uh, for four, six, or even eight hours a day, sometimes more, uh, you would see the same uh, group of people. And if you did a time series, they'd be getting more and more bedraggled uh, as the day went on. And they were always there and they'd take short breaks and they'd come out and they'd get a Sprite at the White House mess or something like that. Sometimes they'd get their lunch, sometimes dinner. And this group, is called the Deputies Committee. Um, and uh, it is hard to overstate its importance as really the pinnacle of the policy process uh, in Washington. The representatives of the various agencies deliberate here on a broad range of national security and foreign policy questions. And the conclusions they come to more often than not uh, are eventually presented to the president as the best recommendation uh, of the US executive branch for action in the wider world. And if you want to know where policy gets made, this is the place. Uh, anyone who's been in deputies committee meeting will probably uh, uh, dispute this and say, no, three out of four times we get sent back to do it again. Um, but that is um, nonetheless the cockpit of policy in, in Washington. And during the Obama administration, it's possible that no one spent more time in those deliberations than Michael Morell, our guest this afternoon. Um, I spent a fair amount of time in meetings in the sit room, uh, though a very, very small fraction compared to what Michael went through. And I came away thinking more often than not that he was uh, the smartest guy in the room. And let me tell you, there were plenty of smart people in the room. And he was smart not only in knowing his brief, but he also knew what would and wouldn't work in terms of policy. And sometimes uh, he was uh, generous, too, in uh, illuminating for other government agencies uh, how they could meet their needs, how their deputies could go home and show their faces um, while still advancing the president's agenda. He was also quite fearless about telling uh, his colleagues hard truths. And I remember one of these, um, the uh, representative of the Director of National Intelligence was briefing on a subject uh, that's very close to everyone's heart right now, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And the, uh, this was uh, at the time of the US drawdown, and the picture was fairly optimistic. And I could see Michael squirming because he, uh, he didn't want to undo a colleague from another part of the intelligence community. But then he couldn't hold himself back, and he leaned back. He said, no, I just don't believe that. And he was right. Anyway, over the last decade, Michael Morell has been a central figure in many of the key developments of our time. In over 30 years at the CIA, he played a key role in the US fight against terrorism, its initiatives to halt the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and its efforts to respond to some of the really major tectonic shifts in the world, including the Arab Spring, the rise of China, and the growth of the cyber threat. As deputy director, uh, from May 2010 until he stepped down in August uh, 2013. He oversaw the agency's analytic and collection operations. So think of two enormous companies, the two very different things and rely upon each other and he was running them both. He represented the agency at the White House, uh, no small challenge, and on Capitol Hill, an even greater challenge from time to time. And he maintained the CIA's relationships with intelligence services and foreign leaders around the world. He was one of the principals in the search for Osama bin Laden, and he participated in the deliberations that led to the raid that killed bin Laden in 2011. And when he wasn't in those deputies' meetings, he was back, as we say, across the river 
uh, running the CIA because the director was almost always dealing either with uh, members of the cabinet, the president, or foreign, foreign officials who were traveling the world. Michael Morell started his career at the CIA in 1980. He worked on East Asia for 14 years, holding many different jobs in analysis and management. And so students take note, you don't necessarily end up doing what you start out. In 1999, he became uh, director of the Office of Asian, Pacific, and Latin American Analysis. He was President uh, George W. Bush's intelligence briefer, and I believe the person who told him that the, uh, plane, that the planes had struck the building and that he believed it was Al-Qaeda. He was also executive assistant to CIA Director George Tenet. Um, he was head of the DI, the Director uh, of, for Intelligence, and um, he served in that role for two years before being appointed Deputy Director. He served as Acting Director during two different stints uh, longer than anyone else in the history of the CIA. Michael Morell holds degrees in economics from the University of Akron and Georgetown, and he now serves as a senior fellow at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. If he wore all the medals and decorations he's received, we would think he was in the old Politburo. <laughs> Sometimes when I think of Michael, I think of that uh, Dos Equis commercial. He is the most interesting man in the world. Um, not because he wears gold chains, as you can see he doesn't, um, but and not because he was the keeper of so many secrets, but because he had to be up to speed on everything that was going on in the world in a way that really no one else uh, had to. And uh, so I've always enjoyed every conversation I've had with him. I should also add that um, while he's here spending the week at Dartmouth, he has taught already, I think, half a dozen classes and is well on his way to meeting every undergrad here. And judging by the audience, a few of them are coming back for more. So let me uh, ask you to join me in welcoming uh, Michael Morell. <laughs> uh, I should have added uh, that he is now uh, enlightening the public as well as, a, as the senior national security commentator for CBS News and is uh, working with uh, Beacon Global Consulting, is that it? Beacon Global Strategies. Global, global Strategies, and your title there is Senior Counselor. Yeah. Which sounds kind of like camp. <laughs> it <kinda> is. <laughs> with the guys I'm working with, right? Uh, yeah, okay, well, we, th that part won't be on the, uh, on the tape. Um, so let's start with the... Can I, uh, say, can I say one thing after uh, that, that very kind introduction, and I, and I have to admit I don't, I didn't recognize the guy you were talking about. <laughs> Um, but that was a technique. Yeah, I yeah, learned yeah, it from I the got, agency. I got it. I got yeah. it. Um, but you know, there's a big difference between. Very important to understand. There's a big difference between between the CIA of the movies, and the real CIA. You know, in the movies, in the movies, senior CIA officials are played by, you know, dashing, rugged men like Harrison Ford and Alec Baldwin and James Earl Jones, right? Now the reality. So about three years ago, I got a rather short haircut. And I walked through my front door, and my teenage daughter took one look at me, and she said, Dad, you look like Forrest Gump. <laughs> so, so no Harrison Ford this afternoon, OK? The other thing I'll say is that, is that Dan said that I was acting director twice, and I was. Um, I have the acting thing down, so if you ever need somebody to act, I'm your guy. <laughs> But I'll also tell you that while I was acting director the first time, um, I was in my armored SUV, and we pulled into a restaurant parking lot. And I got out, and some guy was looking, you know, who's that? And he said to my wife, is that somebody important? <laughs> and she said, he's only acting important. <laughs> <laughs> so it just shows you how much respect I got at home. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's very nice what Dan said, but there is a reality to my uh -huh. life as well. Yeah, well, we're, not, we're all not heroes at home. Um, so we'll start with the, uh, the immediate. Uh, everyone's talking about ISIS, unless you're still in the federal government, in which case it's ISIL, or if you're actually in it, the Islamic State. And um, why don't you give us your view of the, uh, of the measure of the threat? Um, it's, uh, it's been a huge debate, and um, you and I, in fact, debated it just a couple of weeks ago in Washington. So why don't you... Uh, Tell us how big a threat you think this is, both at home, uh, but also to the region. So I believe that this is a significant threat. 
Um, it's a significant threat to the interests of the United States, um, and it's a significant threat in two separate ways, in my view. Um, one is the, the terrorist threat that it poses to the homeland um, and to American citizens um, wherever they are in the world. Um, and that threat can be broken down into a threat that exists today, which is given the number of foreigners who have gone to Syria to fight, and given the number of those foreign fighters who are Americans, and who are Canadians, and who are um, West Europeans who can freely travel to the United States, um, many of those guys who went to Syria are fighting with, with ISIS, um, and any one of those individuals can return to the United States and on their own conduct an attack or can be directed by ISIS to come to the United States to conduct an attack. It would be small scale, um, but it would still be a terrorist attack. That's a possibility that exists today. Um, the other terrorist threat is a much larger one that would happen over the long term if they were able to um, maintain a safe haven. Uh, for an extended period of time. You know, it took from the time that Osama bin Laden said yes to KSM, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's plan to conduct the 9-11 attacks until the attacks themselves was about two years, nine months. That's how long it took to, to carry out that operation. Um, and if, if, if ISIS has a safe haven in Syria or Iraq for an extended period of time and has the foreigners there that it has, and it, it too could put together a 9-11 style attack with time. That's the longer term threat. So that's the threat, that's the direct threat to the US, but there's an indirect threat to the US, which I think is actually more immediate, which is a threat to the stability of the whole region. All right? ISIS puts the territorial integrity, in my view, puts the territorial integrity of the state of Iraq at much greater risk. It's already at risk, but puts it at much greater risk. And it, and, and it, it, it puts the territorial integrity of Syria, which is already gone to some degree, at even greater risk. And to the extent that those two things happen, you risk a spread of that across the Middle East, a spread into Jordan, a spread into Lebanon, um, sectarian violence. Um, so from both of those perspectives, I think it's a very dangerous situation we find ourselves in. One of the questions that's out there about ISIS that I don't think has gotten enough discussion is, you know, why this threat? Why has this one caught fire in, um, in Europe, in North Africa, in all these different countries that foreign fighters are coming from? Uh, the United States is not present on the ground in Iraq in any significant numbers, and when ISIS was really uh, moving ahead, you know, we weren't there at all. Uh, moreover, um, you know, the numbers are astonishing. You know, five, seven, nine times as many people as would went to Iraq or Afghanistan after, well, 2003, 2001, respectively. So how do we explain that? So they didn't, right, right, they didn't primarily go to Iraq, they primarily went to Syria, right? That the civil war was underway in Syria and they went to fight in Syria. They went to fight Assad, you know, who was slaughtering his own people. Um, and, you know, it was a Shia Sunni thing in Syria, um, as well as a lot of other types of wars there. We should actually talk about that. Um, but they were drawn by the fight against Assad. Um, and they ended up not only with ISIS, but they also ended up with um, al-Nusra, which is the al-Qaeda-affiliated group, um, Islamic extremist group in Syria, um, which actually poses a more direct threat to the United States at the moment. Um, so it's quite interesting. So I think it's a combination of being drawn by a civil war in Syria in which, in which Syrians were being slaughtered um, and the ease of getting to Syria. You know, why didn't, why didn't the, the, the war in Mali, the war in northern Mali, generate the same flow of people there? Two reasons. One is, it's really tough to get to northern Mali. It's really easy to get to Syria. You know, fly to somewhere in Europe, you go to Turkey, you go across the border into Syria. Um, and the Syrian, the Syrian Islamic extremists were welcoming to the foreigners, right? 
AQIM in northern Mali, Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb in northern Mali, not particularly welcoming to foreigners. So I think you know, put all these things together. Um, I think the other thing I'd say is that you know we've done the United States government and our allies around the world have done a pretty remarkable job since 9/11 at protecting against um, additional attacks. You know we should get an, we should get an A for that. Right? If, if, if the London and Madrid bombings weren't hap you know, didn't happen, maybe an A plus. But we've done a really bad job of, of not denting the spread of the ideology, right? The spread of the franchise. Um, and I think the, the, the flow of foreigners to the fight in Syria, the flow of foreigners to join al-Nusra and ISIS is a reflection of that spread of that ideology. The ideology is a great um, place to uh, pick up. One of the questions I've been asking myself since I left government, because it was something I worked on a lot now, is the question of can we really do something against the ideology? You know, it's not, it, it's, it's a standard talking point for uh, congressmen and, and generals who don't have to deal with the ideology. Um, it's not, to me, an open, open and shut case uh, that we can, that this isn't something that needs to be worked out within Islamic societies. Yeah, so I think there's, there's little the United States can do. Um, I think most of it has to be done um, by the leadership of these particular countries, and just as importantly by um, leaders of society, including Islamic clerics. Uh, I think that's where the work primarily needs to be done. Um, I think. The United States does have a role to play in making funding available. Um, I think the United States has a role to play in bringing trade to as many places in the world and pushing economic policies in the right direction because I do think economics matters here. Um, but the U.S. doesn't have a role to play in talking about, um, in, in, in talking to Muslims about their religion and how it should evolve. We have no business in that. We have no credibility in that. Um, that risks actually making matters worse. I actually do think there's a country that has done a pretty good job of getting this right, and that's Indonesia. Um, I think that the Indonesians have, um, you know, the Indonesians have focused aggressively on the security side of things in wrapping up terrorists, um, very aggressive on that front, but they've also been fairly aggressive on how do we, how do we make sure that additional people aren't radicalized. And they spend an awful lot of money and an awful lot of focus on tolerance. So, you know, um, to, they, they try to build tolerance into their education system um, in a way that you don't usually see in third world societies. Um, they try to build tolerance into entertainment. Some of the most popular songs in Southeast Asia have come out of Indonesia and they are, they are, they are songs about tolerance. Um, they, they, they get their Islamic clerics to talk about tolerance in mosques. So I think the Indonesians have done, done as probably a good a job as possible here in, um, in, in dealing with, with radicalization before it happens. Countries like Saudi Arabia and the Emirates have done a very good job in dealing with people who have already become radicalized and actually de-radicalizing them. Right. Um, very good job, very, very good programs none of which we have really any significant input into. They know what they're doing. Um, but it is really hard, right? It, 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 it's, it's, um, it's hard because we can't do it. It's hard because the countries themselves have to do it and, and in, 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 in different parts of civil society have to do it. So it's really tough to do. I don't think we're ever gonna get this right. Um, that's why I believe that my children's generation is still going to be fighting this fight, and my grandchildren's generation is still going to be fighting this fight. Well, thanks for that optimistic note. Um, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I, I tend to agree. Um, the president's strategy, um, what, what's right, what's wrong, and how should we feel about the fact that um, uh, you know, our allies who are um, on the front lines in this one are all uh, Arab monarchies? So let me just let me, let me just back up and a little bit of context. Um, I have to tell you, and I've talked to some folks yesterday about this, I have to tell you that I think Syria 
is the most difficult policy problem that I ever saw in my 33 years in government. Um, and I'm, 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 I, I want to make this point because I'm going to criticize the president's strategy here in a minute. Um, but I want to put this in context because this is really tough. This is really difficult. Um, one of the things I said to folks yesterday was, you know, I hate reading op-eds, you know, where in 10 paragraphs somebody says, here's how you solve the Syria problem, here's how you solve the Iraq problem, here's how you solve, here's how you solve the Iran problem. You know, these are incredibly complex problems, um, and you can't explain a solution in 10 paragraphs. You just can't. Um, but but let me just let me just tell you a story about Syria that I think underlines why this is so difficult. And the story I want to tell you is that there's just not one war going on in Syria. There are actually five wars going on in Syria. And each of the wars point in a slightly different direction, in some in a radically different direction in terms of what US policy should be. So the first war there is a war between um, an Arab dictator, or just a plain dictator, um, and his people, and his people have stood up and said, you gotta go. We wanna go in a different direction as a country. We don't want you as our leader anymore. We want a greater say in how we're governed. And that leader says, I ain't going nowhere. And we're gonna fight about it. Now, whether you think we should get involved in that war comes down to a decision of whether you think we should get involved in a humanitarian crisis or not. And there's good arguments on both sides. I won't tell you where I am but there's good arguments on both sides. So that particular war doesn't point in any particular direction for US policy. The second war is a war between Shia and Sunni. It's actually a war between Sunni and Shia and some other groups, but it is primarily a war between Shia and Sunni. And what should the United States posture be in that war? Stay out of it. We have no business sticking our nose into that war, in my view. We're only going to make matters worse. We don't want to take sides in that war. The third war is a really interesting war. It is a proxy war between Saudi Arabia on the one hand and Iran on the other. And it's a proxy war for influence, for long-term influence in the Middle East. Ah, we have our first, you know, our first indication of what US policy should be. We should back Saudi Arabia to the hilt, in my view. Okay, that could be debated, but that's what I think. The fourth war is, is an equally interesting war to the third war. The fourth war is a secular leader, Assad, fighting Al-Qaeda. Who should we support in that war? Well, that's easy, the <laughs> secular leader, right? So now we've got a fourth war here that takes us in a completely different direction in terms of what our policy should be. And then you have a fifth war now that wasn't, that wasn't prominent in 2012, 2013 when the president was making some initial decisions, but now you have a fifth war of the opposition fighting itself. And primarily, quite frankly, of the, of the one Al-Qaeda group, Al-Nusra, fighting with ISIS and the moderate opposition fighting with ISIS. Who should we support in that war? Um, well, not Al-Qaeda at all, right? But Al-Qaeda is actually fighting with the, 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 the good guys here against ISIS. So it gets very, very complicated. So that's just to say this is really complicated, okay? Um, it's not easy. Don't, 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 please don't think it is. So what do I think is right about this strategy and what do I think is wrong about the strategy? So I think the strategy in Iraq is pretty good. I actually have quite a bit of confidence that in um, nine months, 12 months, 15 months, that we, are, we and the Iraqis and our allies are gonna significantly roll back ISIS's territorial gains in Iraq. What gives me that confidence? Um, first, we're on the verge, we're not quite there yet, but we're on the verge of getting a government in Baghdad that um, is a lot more representative of the Iraqi people than the previous government. There was absolutely no way the Sunnis were gonna join in a fight against ISIS as long as Maliki was prime minister. And I actually think that getting rid of Maliki was a huge diplomatic success for the United States, and I think that John Kerry should get an awful lot of credit um, for um, working with uh, our partners for Maliki to take a hike. So we've got uh, the potential for a political solution in Baghdad in which the three primary parties, the Shias, the Kurds, and the Sunnis, uh, feel like they have a stake in the government and can agree on an approach to dealing with ISIS. So that's good news. Two, 
is I think embedding U.S. advisors, U.S. military advisors at this point at the brigade level, not at the tactical level, but the brigade level will significantly strengthen the Iraqi military um, and make them much more effective on the battlefield. Third is our willingness to do airstrikes not only to protect ourselves um, and to protect critical infrastructure and to, and, and to avoid humanitarian crises, but actually to take the airstrikes right to the front of the battlefield. I think that one will, will make an enormous difference with a, a, a ground force that's willing to fight. Um, and so I do believe that we will roll back ISIS in Iraq. So I think the Iraq strategy is pretty solid. I think as solid as the Iraq strategy is, the Syria strategy is that weak. Uh, and the reason the Syria strategy is weak is because there really isn't anybody to fight the ground war there. Um, you cannot defeat um, an insurgency. You can defeat a terrorist group from the air, but you can't defeat an insurgency from the air. You've got to defeat it on the ground with a lot of air support. And right now, we don't have anybody who's fighting on our side in Syria. Um, this idea that we can train the moderate Syrian opposition um, to be that force um, is possible, but it's two, three years down the road before you can get there. Um, the Syrian moderate opposition is not organized. Um, it's, um, it has no command and control. Um, it is much smaller than it was two years ago because many of the fighters left to join al-Nusra, which is a much more effective fighting force. Um, so we're really starting from scratch here in terms of building a fighting force on the ground in Syria. Uh, and then the other problem you have in Syria is you've got Assad, who the president says still has to go. And I agree with that. I agree with that. This guy has butchered thousands of his own people and made homeless probably a third of his population. I think he's got to go. Um, and unlike on the Iraq side, where you do have a political solution, you don't have any political solution that I can see on the Syria side. <clears throat> political solution on the Syria side would be Assad going and a new government there representative of <coughs> the Syrian people without, without, and this is really important, without a destruction of the Syrian military, the Syrian intelligence service, and the Syrian security service. So somehow, to make Syria work, we got to get rid of Assad, which we don't seem to be focused on. We have to do it in a way that we preserve those Syrian institutions so that they can maintain stability after you get a new government, so we don't end up with a, a Libya situation. And you have to deal with ISIS, right? Because what's going to happen is when they're, when, when, when they're taken on successfully in Iraq, they're going to come across that border into Syria. So you have a hammer, but you have a hammer, but no anvil, right? So. Um, Good strategy on the rock side, um, weak strategy on the Syria side. I'm not sure how to make it stronger, though. Well, that's the key thing is, you know, this does seem like the, uh, the problem from hell, as many have uh, characterized it as. And, you know, if you have the idea, I hope you will write that up in. Um, <laughs> so we could talk about ISIS and Iraq and Syria um, until the cows come home, but um, why don't we look a little more uh, farther afield? Um, so it's you know, it's almost a natural law that while we're completely focused on Iraq, something's gonna go boom somewhere else. Where, um, where do you think that boom is gonna come? You know, so I think one of the interesting things to do, and I'll, I'll, I will definitely answer the question and I'm gonna in part answer it now, but I will, I will answer it specifically in a minute. I do think it's important to put the ISIS grab of territory in context. You know, the perception from the media is that the, this is the first time an Islamic extremist group has ever grabbed a significant amount of territory. Wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. You know, the first Islamic extremist grab of territory was in Somalia. You know, Al-Shabaab Al -Shabaab owned most of Somalia. They still own a chunk of Somalia, even after the Ethiopians and the Kenyans aggressively went in and, and took some of it away. Um, the second grab of territory was in Yemen. So, you know, Dan and I lived through a situation where Al-Qaeda in Yemen took advantage of the Yemeni civil war, um, the Arab Spring in Yemen, to grab 25 to 30 percent 
of Yemeni territory. And it took a political resolution um, in Sana'a, crafted in large part by, by US diplomats, um, to allow the Yemeni military to focus on Al-Qaeda and to take all of that territory back. And they took every inch of it back with some support from the United States. And then the third area where Islamist extremists grabbed a lot of territory was in, was in northern Mali during the political crisis in Mali. Um, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb took advantage of the situation and grabbed a huge chunk of territory and held it until the French military came in and forced them back into the mountains. So this is the fourth time. This is the fourth time that an Islamist extremist group has grabbed a significant amount of territory. And it will not be the last. It will not be the last. Across this huge ge geographic area where we now see Islamic extremism, you're going to see this kind of problem pop up over and over and over again over the next five years, 10 years, 15 years. This is going to be a common occurrence. And the way we deal with it is going to be different every time if we're smart about it. Um, but we're going to have to deal with it um, in the future. So this is not the last time you're going to see this play. Now, um, what am I worried about that we're not focused on? Um, so there's something very interesting playing out in Libya, which you do not see talked about in the media at all. There is a war going on in Libya between Islamic extremists and the um, legitimate recognized government of Libya. And they are literally fighting in Tripoli for control of the country. And uh, really folks have, well, have, people aren't focused on this. It's kind of amazing to me. Um, and then the other really significant thing that I think is happening is in Hong Kong. Uh, I think it is a really big deal what is happening in Hong Kong. And it's going to be really interesting to see how the students handle themselves. And it's going to be really interesting to see how the um, Communist Party handles itself. You know, I'm not optimistic here. Um, but I think um, this has the potential to become quite a story um, over the next couple of months. So a few other potential booms. Um, President Ghani took uh, office and he signed the basing agreement um, in Afghanistan, which is very good news, and he's a good friend of the United States. Uh, but we're supposed to be pulling out of there in, in Toto in a couple of years. That's part of the equation. The flip side is, uh, across the border in Pakistan, where there's been an, un, you always say unprecedented amount of turmoil in Pakistan, you're always wrong. Um, you know, it's the most uh, tumultuous country on earth in many ways. And it is, it is unclear to me if there's any reason to believe that Pakistani strategy vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan is gonna change uh, from what it has been historically in wanting to see Afghanistan as its as its strategic depth? So I'm a pessimist on the future. Of course I am. Um, <laughs> I'm a, a pessimist on the future of Afghanistan. Um, I think best case outcome, best case, best case outcome um, is that the Afghan government is capable enough to hold Kabul is capable enough to hold most of the major cities, not all of them, and is capable enough to hold most of the ring road, but not all of it. Um, and I think the Taliban will find sanctuary in the south and the east, and will find pretty significant um, sanctuary. Uh, this is best case. I'll get to worst case in a minute. Um, and in that best case, in that best case, um, Al Qaeda, at the Al Qaeda senior leadership, which still resides in Pakistan, and there's also another Al-Qaeda group that's actually in Afghanistan. Um, both of those groups will go find safe haven with the Taliban. And they will find safe haven with the Taliban no matter what Mullah Omar says about what the Taliban's relationship is with Al-Qaeda. This is a very, very deep relationship based on, on a lot of history now, intermarriage, um, very close relationship. Um, Al-Qaeda will be welcomed back by the Taliban. And when Al-Qaeda gets that safe haven again in Afghanistan, 
I guarantee you the Afghans are not going to be able to deal with it in a military security way. And so if the United States is not willing and able to deal with it, and that means to me leaving counter, a counterterrorism force behind in Afghanistan, then I guarantee you that Al-Qaeda will resurge, they will rebuild, they will rebound, and they will again pose a threat to the homeland out of Afghanistan. And it will be as if the last 13 years of fighting there never happened. That's best case. Now, there were some important ifs in there about leaving U.S. troops behind and what we're willing to, to do vis-a-vis Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. Um, some very important ifs. Um, but worst case, worst case is the Taliban knocking on the door of Kabul within 12 to 18 months of the withdrawal of U.S. forces because the Afghan army collapses the way the, the, the Iraqi army collapsed. Um, so not a very optimistic um, look at Afghanistan and even an even more pessimistic look at Pakistan. So I consider Pakistan one of the most dangerous countries in the world. Why? Um, and this is not short term. You know, this is not looking at the political protests that are going on and, and, and worrying about how those are going to involve. Uh, no, this is long term. Um, you know, the Pakistani economy is a disaster. Uh, Pakistan's demographics um, are frightening in terms of population growth, some of the f most rapid population growth in the world. Um, put those two things together, an economy that is going nowhere and a very rapid population growth, and you have a bunch of people who are going to be entering the labor force with no jobs. You have an education system that is broken. I mean, literally broken. <coughs> Schools that have crumbled to the ground and Pakistani children going to class sitting on the rubble of their schools. Why do you think so many parents send their kids to madrasas? Because there's really no alternative in terms of the public education system. Pakistan spends, Pakistan spends more money on its nuclear weapons program than it does on education. It tells you where its priorities are. On top of that, you have a rising militancy in Pakistan across all of society, including the military. And you put all of that together, you put all of that together, and you create the possibility, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but you create the possibility that Islamic extremists could someday take over that government, and it's a government that, that has nuclear weapons. So that's why I consider it the most dangerous country in the world. Um, and two things need to happen, I think. In two fundamental changes need to happen in Pakistan. And I'm not optimistic about either one of them. Uh, the first is that we really need to have civilian rule, not, not military rule. You know, the military has essentially run the country since the very beginning. And the military has made decisions about what's in the best interest of the military, not about what's in the best interest of Pakistan as a state. And that's why you get some of these wacky resource priority issues. So you, you, you have to have a shift over time to a serious civilian government. It has to be sustained. There's been efforts at it. They've always failed. This one's about ready to fail again. And the other thing that has to change is the deep Pakistani belief that India is an existential threat to the state of Pakistan. It's not. It's not. The Indians forgot about the Pakistanis a long, long time ago. The Indians are looking forward uh, to a much brighter economic future, um, and they forgot about Pakistan as a, as a threat to them a long time ago. But the Pakistanis still see the Indians as an existential threat, and so they, they structure their forces in a way to deal with the Indians when they should be structuring their forces in a way to deal with militancy. And so they have to have a, have a much better understanding of what the real existential threat to the state of Pakistan is, which is their economy and the militancy that they face. And until they understand those two things and start acting on them, um, my worries are going to continue. So, so just to let you know, in, intelligence officers are, no, are often known as the skunk at the garden party <laughs> because we always bring such bad news. So. Um, 
let's, uh, let's see if we can find a little uh, silver lining anywhere here. You've uh, certainly uh, described an awful lot of the big threats we face, and we haven't even gotten to Iran, and I don't mean to start you off on Iran yet, but what do you think of our capacity uh, for dealing with these threats over the next five to 15 years? And uh, while we're at it, why don't we throw in uh, deal with the rising China as well? And um, um, those are huge questions. Yeah, you don't have a lot of time either. So, <laughs> so when I did my first sixty Minutes interview, it was the first time I was ever on TV. I was really nervous. I had no idea what sixty Minutes was going to do in terms of pasting all the pieces together. Um, but at the end of the interview, they asked me, um, what was the single thing that, that kept me up at night? What was the single thing that I worried most about? And I really surprised them by what I said. Because when I was asked that question when I was a serving intelligence officer, I would say terrorists with nuclear weapons. Um, but what, really, what I really, really worry about, and what I told 60 Minutes, was the thing that really keeps me up at night is the failure of our political system here in the United States to make decisions that move our economy and our society forward. That's what I really worry about. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, um, the, most in, the most important determinant of a country's national security is the health of its economy and the health of its society. And if we don't get our act together here at home, then we're not going to have the capacity 15, 20 years from now to do the job we need to do in the world. Um, so that's an advertisement for, for sort of my frustration with our own political system, both, both sides. Um, my former boss, Leon Panetta, is actually much more eloquent on this than I am. Uh, but between, you, you know, for the next 10, 15 years, I think the United States has the capacity to do what needs to be done in the world. I think it's a question of willingness. Um, and there is, among the American public, um, a desire to pull back. And you can see it in the polls. ISIS put a dent in that, um, in that polling, but there's been a trend over time towards it. Um, towards we shouldn't be the world's policemen, we should take care of our own problems, other people should take, you know, do what they can for themselves. Um, and I think that America's leaders need to lead public opinion in what is the right direction in my view, which is we do have a leadership role that, that we have to play in the world because when we don't, bad guys fill the vacuum. Um, and so I certainly, Dan, think we have the capability. Um, what I question is the willingness. So I wanna get to uh, the questions from the audience. I have, um, I have one or two more that I wanna put to you first. And, and I guess um, the first one is um, you spent uh, 33 years in the intelligence business, so there was obviously something you liked about it, and I was wondering if you wanted to uh, tell, especially the students, uh, what it was that you found rewarding. It was the mission. Um, it was the mission of keeping the country safe. Um, it is, I've never found anything as motivating, um, never. Um, it is the thing that I miss uh, about the job. Um, I miss it desperately. Um, I don't miss not knowing the secrets. Um, I certainly don't miss going to the White House and Congress. Um, but I miss the people and I miss the mission. Um, you know, people ask me, you know, people ask me, is Homeland real, is Zero Dark Thirty real? And the answer is, of course not, except for one thing which is Carrie's passion for the job and Maya's passion for the job. Carrie's passion for the job in Homeland and Maya's passion for the job in Zero Dark Thirty is real. It is real. That's what you see in CIA officers. Uh, and that's what I felt for 33 years. You know, when I, um, I told a couple groups yesterday that when, when I used to talk to students, when I was out recruiting, that I, one of the things I would say to them is, um, you know, as you think about what you're gonna do for the rest of your life, as you think about your career, I want you to think about the difference between trucks and terrorism. And I kinda let that hang in the air and not say anything for a few seconds and have everybody look at me like, what the hell is that guy talking about? And then I say, you know, at the end of the day, do you wanna go home and tell your family that you worked with a group of people who sold more trucks 
than any other company on the east coast of the United States? Or do you want to go home and tell your family that you worked with a group of people that stopped a terrorist attack against the United States of America? And I got them. <laughs> and for many of the people that work at CIA, working on terrorism or proliferation or drug trafficking or human trafficking or organized crime, that's what it feels like every day. That's really what it feels like every day. Um, so, you know, there wasn't a single day, you know, this is hard to believe, but if my wife were here, she would agree with me. Um, there wasn't a single day that I didn't want to go to work. And I think I was blessed to have a job like that. Um, I looked, my, my, my wife hates it when I say this, but I looked forward to Mondays rather than Fridays. You know, when I was, when I was the deputy director, I arrived at work at 6 a.m. and half the parking lot was filled. I left work about 7.30 at night and half the parking lot was filled. And that's the kind of dedication that we're talking about here um, for the people who work there. Um, so it's an amazing place to work in terms of, of, of the mission and your service to your country. Um, it's also an amazing place to work in terms of the challenges it gives you and the developmental opportunities it gives you. The managers at CIA really think hard about how do I develop this person, how do I enhance their skills, how do I make them better. Um, agency sent me back to school for 12 months, paid my tuition, paid my salary. Um, I was the graduate student who bought the beer, right, because I had the money. Um, you know, and, uh, and we take care of our employees like that. Um, so it's a remarkable place to work, and I would, you know, encourage every student here to think about it as an option. And let me put one last question to you before we open it up. We haven't even touched on Snowden, um, and I'm certainly hopeful that uh, some in the audience will. Um, but the Snowden uh, episode, uh, which is not over yet, has really, I think, uh, raised anew the large set of questions associated uh, with um, secrecy and espionage and collection and all these things uh, that go on in our intelligence community, uh, which is right there at the heart of, uh, you know, the world's, I think, most, sex most successful democracy. And there's a profound tension there between the two. And you've had plenty of time to reflect on this and probably been asked about it more than you care to recount. But given where we are now, given the mistrust that exists, uh, not just of government, but of the intelligence community, um, you know, what are your feelings about what we need to do to get this right, what we need to do to both perhaps reset the intelligence community, but also reset public understanding uh, regarding what it is that intelligence is about, what it does, how it serves the nation? So I don't believe those people who say that there's no trade-off between the two. There absolutely is a trade-off between security and privacy and civil liberties. Um, and, you know, saying there's no trade-off is, is kind of taking the easy way out. Um, you know, dictatorships tend to be more secure than democracies, I think, um, in terms of, uh, you know, crime and, 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 and the like. Um, certainly, certainly the dictatorships that I saw dealt very effectively with al-Qaeda inside their borders. Um, democracies have struggled a little bit more. Um, so there is a tension. Absolutely, there's a tension. Um, and I think what surprised me about the whole Snowden affair, and, and I want to speak for him, but I think it's probably also true of the president, um, is that we actually have a system. We actually have a system in place that's supposed to take care of this, which is congressional oversight of intelligence activities. You know, Congress created two intelligence committees to oversee the activities of the intelligence community and to essentially pass judgment on behalf of the American people as to what's appropriate and what's not. Um, and in this case, multiple, multiple Senate intelligence committees and multiple House intelligence committees said that the Section 215 telephone metadata program was appropriate. 
and the President of the United, two presidents of the United States said this is the right thing to do. And multiple attorney generals said it was legal. And the FISA court on multiple times said it was legal. I thought that would have been enough, but it clearly wasn't. It clearly wasn't, right? This program gets leaked and the American public loses some degree of confidence in its government. So clearly the systems that were in place to handle this didn't work. Um, so I think the way to deal with this is probably twofold. One is I think that there's gotta be more discussion about intelligence, and the threats we face and what needs to be done to keep the country safe and how much, how much of a price we're willing to pay on privacy and civil liberties. I think we have to have that discussion as a nation. Um, the other thing I think we have to do is um, to constantly reassess the balance between the two. You know, we did, we, we did it once after 9-11 after and we ended up with the program that I was talking about and we really never went back and said, are we still comfortable with this? There was an inertia to the program. And I think when you're talking about people's fundamental rights of privacy and civil liberties, you have to, you have to look at the program maybe once a year, you know, maybe once every two years and say, am I still comfortable with this? Um, you know, I was on President Obama's panel on this very issue and there were two security guys, um, Dick Clark, who served in the Clinton and, and the Bush administrations, a real expert in, in, in terrorism and cyber, um, and me. And then three, three, um, three uh, uh, university law professors, um, you know, really renowned guys. And one of them, Jeff Stone from the University of Chicago, you know, convinced me, I convinced him, I convinced him that this program was really important to protecting the country and that we needed to keep the program. He convinced me that while there was no abuse by the government of this data that it was holding, that there was a potential for abuse. And that we should have a, a healthy distrust of government because government has in the past abused its authority and abused its powers. So he convinced me that while we should maintain the program, the government shouldn't have the right to hold the data, right? Because the government holding of the data creates the risk of misuse. And he convinced me that we shouldn't be able to query that data under a broad court order. We should have to get a court order every time you want to query the data. And that made sense to me. Is there a trade-off there in terms of efficiency? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Um, but, it, but it was reasonable to me given the public reaction to uh, the program once it was disclosed. So a half second follow up. The, the democratic legitimacy conferred by having congressional oversight is a great thing, but if Congress turns tail and runs instead of defending the programs that they've overseen, you don't really have a functioning system. Right, right. Which is and an accurate know, description of what happened. And you know, <laughs> one of the unfortunate things that happened in this case is that the members of the House and Senate Intelligence Committees that had approved these programs took quite a bit of criticism from their non-intelligence committee colleagues, and quite frankly, it risks making them gun shy down the road in approving, you know, tough programs. Okay, we've gone on long enough, at least I have. Um, so, um, there are microphones. Uh, please uh, put your hands up, and uh, I think I saw one right here. And I would ask you to keep your questions short so we can have as many as possible and make sure there's a question mark at the end. Yeah, um, thank you for coming. Uh, your five wars in Syria are number two and three, uh, Sunni Shia and Saudi Iran, not the same. And to what extent can we expect a massive ethnic cleansing in that region like we saw, unfortunately, in Europe the last century? So I think there's some overlap between the second and third wars, but they're not the same. Because the, the, the proxy war between Saudi Arabia and, and Iran is not just about religion. In fact, it's more about who's gonna be the hegemonic power in the Middle East. 
Um, and so it's much more about that than it is about religion, I think. Um, you know, I think, going, going, going back to my concerns about ISIS, um, I do worry that um, and if we are unsuccessful in dealing with ISIS, that we could face um, sec real, you know, a much more sectarian bloodshed in the Middle East than we currently have. Next question. Back there. Is there a security need or a moral responsibility for American nation building in the Middle East? So there's a security need. There's a security need. You know, I thought, and this was just me sitting in my little corner of the sit room, right? And because the CIA does not advocate policy, I didn't say a word. Um, but it seemed to me that the single most important thing that the United States could have done after Mubarak fell would have been to have a martial kind of plan for Egypt. You know, the United States and Europe getting together with a five billion or $10 billion plan to really develop the Egyptian economy in a very significant way. Um, we didn't have the money, Europe didn't have the money, didn't happen, it's not the way we think. Um, and so do I, I do think there's a great benefit, right, to nation building. Um, I don't think we have a moral responsibility I think we, had, we, we, we have an interest in doing it because it's in our national security interest. Um, but I don't, think, you know, I don't think that we should be on the ground with our military trying to build nations. You know, that hasn't worked, clearly. Um, but to the extent that we can, the extent to, that we can help nations make the right economic policy decisions and incentivize those economic policy decisions um, with aid and investment, I think would be a very, very good thing. We just don't happen to have a lot of resources at the moment. So I'm gonna pick two, and I hope the, whoever gets the microphone first will go first and then go second. Professor Eichelman down here, and the gentleman with his hand up there. Sorry, so I, I really screwed that up. Is there someone over here? There's number two, we'll come to you in a second, sir. Um, I guess I should breathe a, a sigh of relief because there's three places you didn't mention and I'm just wondering whether it was time or we should uh, take a break. Uh, Russia, uh, uh, the Israel-Palestine situation, and let's not forget North Korea. Can we stand down and relax about those three or did you just run out of time? Thank you, Dale. You got to all the things that I think we put on the poster and haven't gotten to yet. So. Let's take them one at a time, right? So, um, North Korea, um, unlike Iran, North Korea has a nuclear weapon today. They've done three tests. Um, North Korea has fielded um, an ICBM. They've never tested it, but they've fielded it. We don't know for sure whether they can mate a nuclear weapon to that ICBM but they've had enough time that they probably can and probably make a warhead small enough to put it on um, um, a missile, um, which means that they may have the capability to deliver a nuclear weapon to the continental United States. Not with any reliability um, and not with any accuracy, um, but I'm not sure either one of those matter that much when you're talking about nuclear weapons. Um, you also have a society that is fundamentally broken. Um, and cannot, cannot last forever. The status quo is not possible. Um, you also have a situation where North Korea gets what it wants by provoking South Korea, the United States, and Japan. And these provocations are sometimes quite innocuous, and other times they're quite dangerous. Um, the sinking of the South Korean submarine, um, you know, pretty serious event. The shelling of the South Korean village, um, pretty significant event. Um, both of those brought to you by this young leader, by the way. Um, so South North Korea is definitely a place that we gotta worry about. Um, I think it's a matter of time before it collapses. Um, and you 
know, we're going to have to manage the collapse in a way that, that maintains everybody's security. Um, and in the meantime, you just hope nothing bad happens. You know, the South Koreans have absorbed, without retaliation, many of these provocations. Um, but the politics in South Korea have evolved to the point where I think the South Korean public, you know, the next time there's a major provocation, is going to say, hey, hit back. Um, so there's a real risk here of, you know, there's a, the, there's a risk of things getting out of control in the Korean Peninsula. So no, we don't have to stop worrying about it. Um, the Israeli-Palestinian problem. Um, I do not see a solution. Um, I don't think the deal that Arafat was offered back in just the fall of 2000, um, I don't think the Israelis would ever make that offer again. You know, I think the politics in Israel um, have moved significantly to the right, and I think they've continued to move to the right, and I just don't see a deal. Um, and I really haven't thought through the ramifications of what I just said. Um, Russia. I'm going to take a couple minutes on Russia. This is really important. Um, so context is everything as an analyst, right? When, you, when, 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 an, when a policymaker wants to hear from an analyst, what they really want is context. So I think there's three pieces of context that are really important to understand when you're thinking about Russia, Ukraine. Uh, and the first is that if Vladimir Putin were here and he trusted everybody here, right? If you were all his oligarchs, right? Um, and if you asked him, what are you trying to do? He would say, I'm trying to reestablish the Russian Empire. That is not an analytic construct made up by analysts at CIA. It's what he actually thinks. It's what he's actually trying to achieve. It is his long-term objective. And if you said to him, Vlad, what does that mean? Right? He, would say, he would say ownership of, control over, or significant influence in all of those parts of the world that used to be the Russian Empire. And by the way, guess what? That pretty much matches up with what the former Soviet Union looked like. And he would tell you, that is his long-term goal. He would tell you, this is why, this is why I'm in power. This is what I'm all about. This is what I want my legacy to be. And he would tell you that his short-term goal is to make sure that he doesn't lose any additional pieces of the Russian Empire, the former Soviet Union, to the West in the form of joining NATO or the EU. Joining the EU or, God forbid, joining NATO. So that's the first piece of context. That's what this guy's all about. The second piece of context is that all of those former pieces of the Russian Empire are important to him. Um, all of those former pieces of the Soviet Union are important to him. Ukraine is by far the most important of all of those former pieces. Why? Four reasons. One is ethnicity. Russians are Slavs, Ukrainians are Slavs. They think of each other as brothers. We're going to come back to that in a second. The second is history. You all know that when the Russian state was first created back in the 9th or 10th century, I, I, I forget, um, Ukraine was part of Russia. And the capital was not in Moscow, right? The capital was in Kiev of that first Russian state. And so Russians think of Ukraine as part of them. And then the third reason is, what is the thing that Vladimir Putin most fears? The thing he most fears are people coming out into the streets of Moscow as they came out in the streets of Kiev and saying, we want to go in a different direction. We want different leadership. We want you to go. He is scared to death of that. And it happened in Kiev. It happened in a Slavic country. It happened in a country that used to be part of the Soviet Union. And that scares the hell out of him. And so he wants it not to be successful in, in Ukraine so that there is no precedent set for, for Moscow. And then the fourth reason is that he and his oligarch buddies are heavily invested in the industries of eastern Ukraine. And they don't want to lose that investment. So that's the second piece of context. The third piece of context is, who is this guy? Who is this guy Putin and how does he think, right? Um, I think Bob Gates put it best when, when he said, um, you look in Putin's eyes and you see KGB, KGB, KGB. It's kind of tough for 
intelligence <laughs> officers say, right? That somehow being an intelligence officer warps you. Um, but what does that mean for, for Putin? He's a bully. Um, he's a thug. Um, he only understands relative power. Um, and unlike any, any businessman anywhere in the world who believes that in a negotiation you can have win-win, he does not believe that's possible. He only believes in win-lose. And he is not the great chess master that he has the image he's created. Right? He hasn't thought this thing you know, 10 moves out. He's actually very reactive. So he didn't think, I am absolutely certain, he did not think about taking Ukraine until he lost Crimea, until he lost Ukraine politically. And he needed to do something to save face. And Ukraine became, and Crimea became an option. The other thing about Putin, and this is, this is what makes him particularly dangerous, is, is he is entrepreneurial. He's a risk taker. And when he takes a risk and he succeeds, he's willing to take even greater risks. And why should we be worried about that? Because he thinks he won here. I think that the big loser here is Russia. Right? I actually think the big loser here is Russia because he has destroyed any hope of Russian integration with the West for the next decade. So I think the big loser here is the Russian economy and the Russian middle class that he somehow has painted the image that he's the great winner and he feels like the winner and he's drunk with success. And what I really worry about is, you know, in Ukraine, Ukraine is much more important to him than it is to us. He's willing to go to war to fight over Ukraine, we're not. Right? But that's not true in the Baltics. I don't think it's true in the Baltics. I think we would go to war with Russia over the Baltics. And I wonder if, A, he knows that. And what I wonder, B, given his personality and his risk-taking, whether he might do something in the Baltics that trips a wire um, that takes us to a place we don't want to be. If you were next, and then you were. So. There was no uh, retention of forces agreement when we left Iraq. Uh, why was that, and what difference would it have made if there was one? Very good question. Um, you know, I believe that there are a lot of factors behind the rise of ISIS. I believe that one of those factors was the fact that U.S. troops left the country in 2011. And I believe that was a factor in the rise of ISIS for two reasons. One is we could no longer help the Iraqi military um, keep al-Qaeda in Iraq on its back heels, as they were when we left. And the other is our departure, our departure, um, our departure gave Maliki a free hand politically. And he used that free hand politically to take a number of steps to that essentially disenfranchised the Sunnis and leading moderate Sunnis to actually support ISIS. And the US military in the country supported the Iraqi military in significant ways, made them more effective in their fight against AQI, and it constrained Maliki politically in terms of what he could do. Um, it was very important to get a status of forces agreement. Um, we could not leave US troops in Iraq without a status of forces agreement uh, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, how hard we pushed, I don't know. You know, there's people who blame President Obama for not leaving troops behind, but it was a two-man dance, right? It was a dance between Maliki and the President. And so I really don't know enough about the diplomacy to come to a judgment about who's really at fault here, but I think it would have been helpful to have those US troops there. And I would hope that people are thinking about what happened in Iraq when they're thinking about whether to leave troops behind, whether to rethink their decision to leave troops behind in Afghanistan. 
One issue that uh, directly affects Iraq, too, and any future of it is the Kurds in the north, and you haven't mentioned that. That also has broad implications for Turkey and for Iran, where there are significant Kurdish populations. How do you see that turning out? So Dan and I had this conversation earlier today about, you know, is Iraq going to hold together as a country? And I think we would both, you know, if we were, if we were forced to say right now, I think both of us would say no. Um, you know, the Kurds really want to go their own way. And quite frankly, they were on the verge of going their own way um, until the United States was able to get rid of Maliki and put together this government in Baghdad that was more inclusive. They were ready to call a referendum uh, for independence. Um, you know, and I think, I think that is a dangerous thing. Um, I think it's a dangerous thing because I think the Kurds in Syria would want to join, and I think the Kurds in Turkey would want to join, and I think the Kurds in Iran would want to join. Um, and, you know, that creates all sorts of problems. Um, but I do think eventually, you know, I, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of of the belief that Iraq is going to be hard to hold together over the long term, and eventually you're going to see some sort of Kurdish state in the north. Professor Abishai. Hi, if uh, Ben Affleck were in this room and uh, he came to you and said that he was going to write a movie and star in it as an acting CIA director and heard you describe the situation in Syria as being ideally one in which Assad would not be there, but the regime would more or less remain intact. And he told you that the climax of the movie was that he was going to, as acting CIA director, engineer the assassination of Assad, or engineer a cruise missile hitting him. Um, what about that scenario would you tell him he is not seeing? In other words, what's the consequence that he would not be seeing? There's a ban against assassinations. <laughs> <laughs> Executive Order 12333. <laughs> you know, and um, you know, what allows the United States of America to kill a terrorist? It's because there's a judgment that the terrorist represents an imminent threat to U.S. persons, right? So it's essentially like being on a battlefield um, and soldiers being allowed to kill somebody who poses an imminent threat to them. And that's what makes killing a terrorist who poses an imminent threat to the United States not an assassination. And unfortunately, Assad does not pose an imminent threat to the United States. I'm assuming Frank Church isn't in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great movie. I love it. So are there any, uh, I'm looking for student hands, uh, if, if there might, well, here's one right here. All you have to do is ask. OK, Mr. Raskoff. Peter, for the camera, please. Is the cyber threat from China primarily an economic threat related to the theft of intellectual property, or is there a serious national security dimension? So, great question. Um, I'm going to broaden it a little bit. Okay. Uh, I'm going to broaden it by saying that I think that cyber is the fastest growing threat to the United States. Um, I think terrorism is the number one threat we face today. Um, I think cyber is the fastest growing and is, is now number two. And it comes in three dimensions. Um, it comes in the form of cyber espionage. Um, and cyber espionage is stealing stuff, right? And some of the stuff being stole is national defense secrets, national security secrets. It's the kind of stuff that we steal. Right? Um, I don't think we need to worry about that. Right? That's people spying on each other. The second kind of thing that's stolen is um, uh, commercial intellectual property. Right? And to the tune of, of, of hundreds of billions of dollars of lost intellectual property. So that's something else that's stolen. Right? So there's cyber espionage. 
right? And then there is um, cybercrime. Cybercrime now generates more money than the illicit drug trade. Cybercrime now generates more money than the illicit drug trade. Right? And these are cyber criminals doing all sorts of things. Um, and then third, you've got cyber warfare. Right? You, have, you have countries preparing for cyber war against the United States. You got countries preparing to attack our critical infrastructure if they were ever to get into a hot war with the United States. Right? Okay, so who's doing this? Um, the Russians. So the Russians are very aggressive at cyber espionage focused on national defense secrets, and they're very aggressive at um, preparing for cyber warfare. Um, they're better than the Chinese. Um, the Chinese uh, do both cyber espionage for national defense secrets as well as for intellectual property, and they're preparing for cyber war. And then you've got the Iranians and the North Koreans who are preparing for cyber war and who might be willing to use those tools in an asymmetric way against the United States in a not hot war situation. So this is a very serious problem today and it's going to get, it's going to get more serious. And, and why is it going to get more serious? Um, one is that offense is always ahead of defense in this game. And Entities that need to be protecting themselves don't always do everything they can to protect themselves. Um, so even though there is defense that you can put against the offense, people often don't do that defense. Secondly, the tools that you need to play in this game are increasingly available on the gray market. They are, they are put together in countries where there are no laws against it, where those laws are vague, or where those laws are not enforced. And so small intelligence, small intelligence agencies, you know, who don't have the resources themselves to do this are going out and buying these tools and getting into the cyber game. And cyber criminals are doing the same thing. And these tools are proliferating and proliferating and proliferating. And then the other reason it's, it, it's going to get more difficult is because right now these, these, cyber, these cyber actions, these cyber attacks are primarily, um, are primarily over the internet, they're, 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 they're attacks across the network, right? But as we do a better job of defending those networks, the adversaries are going to come at us in additional ways. One of the ways they're going to come at us is through insider attacks, right? Recruiting people to get inside a company or inside a government agency to get inside of a network to steal data. You know, Edward Snowden, I don't believe, was spying for the Russians or the Chinese when he stole that data, but it's a great example of what the damage a Russian or Chinese agent could do if you were able to get one in that situation, right? And then the third is supply chain operations. So if you are a company that the Chinese want your intellectual property and you're buying a server, the Chinese can get in between the manufacturer of that server and you and put something on it and boom, they're inside your network. So they're going to move up market as our defenses move up market. Uh, and this is going to be a problem for, for a long, long, long time. What strategic opportunities do you see for the United States in the years ahead? So I think, we, got, we never talked about China. I'm going to talk about China as a strategic opportunity. Right? Everybody talks about it as a strategic challenge. I'm going to talk about it as a strategic opportunity. Um, there is no more important bilateral relationship than, to the United States than our relationship with China, bar none. Um, and there are some challenges to this relationship, obviously. Right? There's a military challenge, um, um, and there's a, there's a rising power on the part of China, status quo power on the, on the part of us. They want a bigger say in the part of the world in which they live. We're going to have to give some ground on that. So there's challenges. But I think there's some real opportunities. And the opportunities are the fact that we both have an interest in our economies doing well. There is a co-interest in that. And secondly, I think increasingly our national security interests 
are overlapping and will increasingly overlap. And I think there's room, that we, room to work with the Chinese on a whole range of national security issues. And I think we want to grab those opportunities um, and take advantage of them so that this relationship ends up in the right place rather than the wrong place. Okay. Right here. Hi. Um, so something that people often talk about when they're talking about Obama's foreign policy is drones. And I'm wondering, a lot of people say that by um, using drone strikes, we're terrifying the people in the surrounding area and thus making it more likely that they'd be radicalized. Do you think that's a significant enough worry that we should consider scaling back drone strikes in certain areas where they might not be as essential? Or do you think it's just uh, the drone strikes are far more effective and thus necessary? Yeah. So good question. So as the President of the United States has said, the United States conducts drone strikes um, to kill terrorists um, in various places in the world. Um, said that publicly a year ago. Um, I will tell you with absolute certainty that there is no more effective tool um, at mitigating the threat that terrorists pose to the United States than drone strikes. I will also tell you with absolute certainty that the claims of collateral damage and the claims of terrifying the population um, are, are significantly overstated um, and are largely propaganda by those people that don't want us to be conducting those strikes to include Al-Qaeda. Um, you know, does the fact that the United States conducts drone strikes lead to more terrorists? I don't know. <clears throat> Maybe. But even if it does, I got to deal with the terrorists who are trying to attack me today, right? Um, who, who have a plot in hand, who have the capability, who want to do it. Um, you got to do something about that person. And you know, as the president made clear, we only conduct drone strikes when there is no opportunity to capture the person. I mean, capture is always the first the first choice because then you get an opportunity to get intelligence from that person. So only when there's, an, there's no chance of capture and, and only when there is near certainty that he is a bad guy trying to kill Americans and when there is near certainty that no civilians will be killed. Um, so I am a supporter of the program. Um, and I wish, I wish that we as a government could talk more about it and I wish we as a government could be more transparent about it so that we could put an end to these claims of, of collateral damage and terrifying the population, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, we have two more minutes. And uh, so this is gonna be one really short question right here because Michael has to get to dinner with uh, students and I gotta do that Washington thing of hustling him out the door. Hi, um, you mentioned America's leadership role in the world. Do you believe that the U.S. should take a more proactive approach in stopping the Ebola outbreak, or do you think that doing so would put our own citizens at too great of a risk? So I think that Ebola is a very, very big deal. Um, I was at a dinner the other night where somebody sarcastically said, you know, the president's put twice as many troops in West Africa to deal with Ebola as he's put in Iraq to deal with ISIS. And they said it sarcastically, right? And I said, maybe that's exactly right. You know, given the threat here posed by Ebola and the possibility that it could um, evolve genetically, right, to a point where it could be transferred um, through the air. Um, so I think it's a very serious issue. I think um, we're doing, as far as I can tell, and I'm not an expert in this, but as far as I can tell, we're focused on this. I think we came to it a little bit late, um, but better late than never, and maybe we need to do more. But absolutely, I would say the United States should do whatever it can to deal with this because um, this could become a very, very serious issue. Okay, and with that, I wanna thank you all for joining us today, and above all, I wanna thank our speaker.
being incredibly enlightening today. So thank you very much.